Hi, everyone. This is Mary Keurig with Frontrunners Innovate, and I have a special pleasure to introduce you today, Nikita Shukla. And Nikita, you're in Massachusetts, correct? Yes. Yes. Okay. I wondered that when I was looking at your profile and saw Los Angeles all over it. I'm like, wait a minute. She must have lots of friends there. But uh, <laughs> Nikita, is, it's a special pleasure to have you here. I love introducing uh, young people with such passion and have already hit the leadership road of advocacy for certain issues that are important to them. But mainstay for you is in the healthcare space. And so that is uh, where you, you sit, women in global health and also have had some experience working with the Clinton Health Access Initiative. Um, but the advocacy work is probably a lot of what we're gonna talk about today. So the Youth Advocate with the World Economic Forum and uh, Global Shapers piece of that and Women of Color Advancing Peace, Security and Conflict Transformation. I can't wait to talk about that because it hits so many areas that are specific to the types of work that we like to get involved in. So heading into grad school, <laughs> <laughs> and, and finishing education. We've got a lot to talk about with you. So let's start where you feel like it began. So let's go to your background and tell us a little bit about what brought you to the space that you're at now. Yeah, totally. First of all, thank you so much for having me here. Um, in terms of my background, so, you know, I'm a first generation South Asian woman in the US. And so I have very strong roots in India as well as America. But mm -hmm. I think the first most salient example of me wanting to get into health and into women empowerment and into like youth advocacy was when I interned in India my freshman year of college. And um, I worked at a domestic violence shelter um, with women. It was called Sahara. And we were able to just talk to women, understand their problems, understand their barriers to entry, understand why they are where they are, uh, why they're not getting job opportunities. And, mm -hmm. you know, childcare was a really big issue for them as well. So it was really great having that experience talking to women. And as like an 18 year old, I had never really interacted with people in that capacity, mm -hmm. but it was eye opening. I was just like, oh, there's a lot of need out here. And there's also a lot of opportunity as someone who, kind of bridges Western and Eastern culture for me to be the liaison or the advocate um, in that capacity. That's fantastic. How did you get that opportunity, by the way? Um, I was I was interning at a hospital that um, I had some connections at, and then I realized I don't really want to be a doctor and I didn't really <laughs> want to work <laughs> in the medical field exactly. So then I just kind of put my resume out there, was talking to people around the Delhi area uh, where my family is from, mm -hmm. and just happened, they happened to have a spot for interns. So it was kind of serendipitous, but very impactful. I would imagine so. That was your first opportunity to experience impact work, really, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Well, that stuck with you, did it not? <laughs> so bring us up to what you're, what led you to what you're doing now? I mean, clearly you're in a space where you're getting ready to, to go back into your education and uh, academically kind of strengthen your, yourself there. Um, what's going on with you right now with the, with the work that you're doing? Yeah, the work that I currently do is in health. Um, I work in international development. So I think similar to what I experienced in India, I experience now at work because mm -hmm. I am kind of the liaison between uh, the work that I do in America and the work that is being impacted in East Africa, where most of my work is based. Okay. Um, so I work in health system strengthening, which basically is like universal health care. We're trying to make health systems in a specific country robust so that they can deal with diseases, they can deal with, um, yeah, a pandemic, for example. Yeah. <laughs> um, so my work is really rooted in the data part of that, trying oh, to okay. collect enough data, trying to make sure that anything that we are implementing is data-driven and evidence-based. So I love the work, um, but I think where I am trying to pivot now is more in the advocacy piece and the policy piece and making sure that the work that we're doing is diverse, equitable, and inclusive um, when we're actually implementing mm -hmm. any sort of intervention. So let's talk about East Africa. Can you give me some idea of what country or countries that you're working in? Yeah, yeah. so I, work, I worked in Ethiopia mostly um, and a little bit in Rwanda. And, and what was the second? Rwanda. 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 Okay. Gotcha. 
um, talk to me about the challenges that you face with that. What are the, the biggest challenges that you see in working in that space in those particular countries? Yeah, I think the biggest challenges are youth advocacy and being a youth in this space. Like I am still very much a junior and in my beginning parts of work. <laughs> and I think seeing like who's at the table and who's making decisions um, in these countries. And my identities are youth. You know, I'm a female, I'm a South Asian female. And I think all of those identities kind of impact who gets a seat at the table. And I definitely see it when I'm in the countries, like are women being represented? Are, are, are young people's voices being heard? Are other types of ethnicities also being heard in the countries? Um, so that's why I really got interested in international development through the women of color advancing peace and security, um, because they really unpack a lot of these questions and unpack a lot of these difficult topics. So from the standpoint of tasks or actions that you take, particularly with this last organization you just mentioned, because it covers a lot of little bases there that are extreme and important, and you're hitting cultural norms and patterns and mindsets that more than anything else, almost more than policy uh, changes, you almost have to hit that sort of mass mindset uh, situation. I mean, it's like a chicken or the egg. Um, do the mindset changing the mass mindset happen first or does the policy happen or does the, you know, what, what do you think is the, the balance there? Totally. I think it's, I think it's a little bit of both, honestly, because we have been working really hard internally in my personal work and in my professional work, I've been working really hard to incorporate a lot of behavioral changes. And that mm -hmm. starts with having hard conversations and what we call courageous conversations where you're just discussing, like we're discussing our backgrounds, our privilege, our power dynamics as people that work in international development, where are we oppressed and where are we the oppressor in our conversations? Um, so those are really difficult conversations and that's a very much a behavioral change. But then out of those conversations, we come up with um, key performance indicators and programmatic ideas in terms of if we're putting forward a grant or if we're putting forward a proposal, mm -hmm. are they hitting gender equity? Are they hitting racial equity? Are, mm -hmm. are we looking at all the spheres of identity or are we just looking at, um, you know, mm -hmm. what, yeah, what is our intervention? So I think it is a little bit of both really in this, in the process. So when you talk about uh, conversations that you're having, give me an idea of the types of people you're having those conversations with. Are they NGO leads? Are they influencers inside country? Are they government officials or, you know, church officials? Tell me who you're talking to. Yeah, I think all of the above, like uh, minus the church officials, I think we're having conversations. So I've been part of conversations with NGO leads through the Women of Color Advancing Peace yeah. and Security, where all of us are sitting down and trying to understand, you know, where does colonialism and international development intersect? And, you know, how can we kind of disrupt that? And where's our place in international development as women of color? How do how are we uniquely situated in this to make sure that we are un like un, um, unwrapping inter like uh, colonialism. Uh -huh. And then like within my friend circle and within like my groups at work. So I think it's kind of having conversations with whoever you can at whatever capacity you can. Interesting. Um, so from a structure standpoint, are, are those conversations just sort of organically happening or are you having, um, is there a process for how you reach the, the type of people? Are there summits or anything like that that would help stir up those conversations? Yeah, I think at work, it, it's organically happening. I think especially with the, the current events and um, especially understanding like the Black Lives Matter movement mm -hmm. um, and understanding you know what's happening in the various countries that we're working in, um, what's happening in Ethiopia right now and what's happening in Zambia and Zimbabwe, all the countries that we're working in, it's important for us to take a step back and unpack our own, our own privilege and our own power. So that's happening organically. But then in terms of other pers personal conversations I'm having, they're happening definitely through uh, youth summits or um, youth listening sessions. I was a part of a youth listening session um, where people just wanted to hear mm -hmm. how youth and health are dealing with some of these issues. So it's, it's pretty, pretty varied, I would say. Fantastic. 
So, you know, when we were talking before we came on record, one of the things that you wanted to, to hit on was the Y7, I think you said, did I get mm-hmm. that right? Let's talk about that a little bit. Tell us what it is and what you want to share about that. Yeah. So um, I'm sure people know about the G7 and the G20, which are like the two uh, biggest summits of the year where mm-hmm. we have uh, political heads come together and discuss key issues. And within that, there are other, I guess, sub committees um, that can roll up into the G7 and into the G20, one of them being the Y7. Um, This year, the Y7 was held in London, but Mm -hmm. it's mostly around youth coming together from those seven countries and discussing the same topics that the G7 leaders would also discuss, but from a youth perspective and understanding what youth in our country want to push forward. That's interesting. So that is uh, why Y7 why is a committee, not an event, correct? It's both. It's a committee oh, and an event. Okay. Yeah. So it's an it's a committee where all of us are doing a lot of pre-work before the event. And then we okay. all come together, sort of like Model UN, I would say, where we all come together in a Y7 forum and we kind of debate what goes into our proposal, um, depending on our country's stance or the, what we've discussed with the youth in our country. And then we put that proposal up to the G7. Okay, that was what I was gonna ask. What do you do with the proposal once you have it? Mm-hmm. Okay, so the next one would be when and where? Do we have that already set? I'm not sure where it is, but it's next year. So this year's has already been completed, yeah. um, but it'll be next year. Okay, very good. So we'll have to keep up with you on that. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I was. Um, it's definitely a very, competitive process, but I'm always happy to answer any questions or put forward any recommendations um, if anyone's interested. Fantastic. And it's global, correct? Global. Yeah. Yeah. So can you give us a hint of some of the topics you guys are talking about? Yeah. Um, We've been talking a lot about mental health in Um, the Y7. mm -hmm. Um, This year, that was a really big push for the youth was to include some sort of, as we know, like mental health, especially with COVID has exacerbated um, and specifically with youth, Mm -hmm. with unemployment, um, with the lack of economic empowerment, with some of these diversity, equity and inclusion issues, Mm -hmm. mental health has continued to be a really, really big issue. Um, So this year they pushed forward mental health through the Y7 proposal and it actually got into the G7 proposal, which is like super exciting. Yeah. So we had it like in our proposal in 2019, but it wasn't at that point. Yeah, it wasn't picked up. But I think years and years of advocacy, we finally have it in the G7 proposal this year. It's I think that's incredibly um, envisionary. For, mm-hmm. for you. And, and, and unfortunately, in a lot of African countries, it's such a, a taboo sort of subject and nobody wants to be labeled with any of that. But what I am experiencing myself in talking with people, it's starting to emerge in those countries as something that they're really starting to want to deal with. I have mm-hmm. um, a princess out of Zambia, as a matter of fact, um, who has started the Healing Tree of Nations. She's from that area. She went to London to get uh, her education, became an attorney went back to Zambia, served on the judicial uh, bench. So she became a judge. And what she was seeing is people coming before her who really didn't belong in the correction system. They just had mental health issues. And so her answer to that was step away from the bench and start the Healing Tree of Nations, which will be both a physical location there in Zambia, but also an online uh, resource for people all over, particularly all over Africa, to source any kind of... um, mental health, let's just say assistance that you need to keep you, you know, in, let's just say mental wellness. So whether that be, you know, yoga classes or psychiatric (laughs) referrals or, um, you know, meditation services, you know, anything and everything that can support you in your mental wellness journey. Um, And honestly, I kind of think that once you engage something like that, it's on, it's a lifelong sort of endeavor and process. I mean, I hear people all the time. I was on a radio hearing uh, one of my favorite, you know, band leaders or whatever that was talking about. He's 70 years old now, and he's just just as energetic and passionate about what he does um, as anybody. And he said, the reason why is because I got out of the drugs, alcohol, and everything else that was slowing me down and sluggishing my system. And he said, that is thanks to a guru I met in New York City. And he said, it changed my life. I became vegetarian and, you know, everything got cleansed 
And it's a lifelong journey for him. It's not just, it happened. I went through like this little boot camp thing for three weeks, got clean and went on with life. It's became, yeah, totally. so I think it's, it's at that place now where if you, if you engage that process, you understand that's as important as breathing, you know, air and eating good food and, you know, all the basics of your life that you have to do. So it's paying attention. And sometimes I think it has to do a lot with like support and just asking yes. people like, how are you? And I think mm -hmm. a lot of times in professional settings, it's mm -hmm. a little bit taboo. And I don't think it's a cultural thing. I think it's like a, I think it is a cultural thing actually professionally where we yeah. want to keep our personal life and our professional yeah. life so yeah. separate that um, even a moment to ask your colleague, how are you feels a little bit weird or stifled or yeah. just, it feels well, like they maybe, take it wrong. and uh, now yeah. Yeah, yeah and I think grass. I think those types of things where we're all burning out, we're all dealing with mm -hmm. a pandemic. Um, it just starts with how are you? And you know, a lot of the work that um, the Y seven is doing is trying to get mental health at, at the forefront of a lot of these policy making decisions. Yeah. And yeah. very good. Great. Well, I applaud you on that, and I, I hope that it stays that way and that it continues because I have a feeling it's not just one year that needs to be as a priority. It's going to be totally. Yeah, it's going to have to, to be there for a while. So excellent. So now we've talked about where you are, <laughs> what you're doing uh, to a certain extent. Where are you going? So we know that you're heading into grad school. What do you want to do with your education afterwards? Where do you think you're headed at this point? Yeah, I'm not going in yet. So I'm applying um, okay. for next year. But the the I guess after having all these experiences and understanding that you know youth advocacy is important female empowerment is important, mental health is important. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like the next step for me is to kind of use my data slash analytics background. Most of my work has been in data and analytics mm -hmm. um, and I guess bridge that with policymaking and bridge that with uh, development because I do see sometimes there's a disconnect with um, there's like a disconnect between the private and public sector. And I worked in the private sector and I've worked in the public sector at this point. And I think there's really great pros from both of them. The private sector is super efficient, super fast. Like things are being um, created day in and day out. Mm -hmm. And in the public sector, it's a little bit slower. It's a little bit governed by other stakeholders. Sometimes mm -hmm. the policy decisions aren't made in the best interest um, because of external factors. Mm -hmm. And I think the bridge between the two is to have some sort of hybrid between um, the fast paced nature and the data driven background of private companies, but use that for policy decisions that are impactful and mission driven and help with DEI or help with international development. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of where my, my path is forward. Well, that, that's an innovation path. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You'd be an innovator, that's for sure. Um, if you can figure out how to, to bridge those two uh, in some way or another and create some kind of a hybrid organization, you will be the darling of the social entrepreneurship <laughs> world. <laughs> I can tell you that. Um, it is that mission versus money, that old you know, saying well, mission yeah. versus money. And I think when uh, you find the the space of, of social entrepreneurship, which I've been begging LinkedIn to try to put a category for that, which they have yet to do because yeah. it is one. And you have to acknowledge that there's so many uh, social entrepreneurs out there that, that there's even a certification of B Corp, you know, um, space there for that. If you wanted to get certified to be super good at what you're doing. So that's kind of that hybrid, that B Corp is almost like that hybrid to get certified as the greater good business that you are, but also um, have your foot in the for-profit world. Um, so it, it's really interesting that that's there and yet still some of the world hasn't figured out that that is in place there. You're either business or you're nonprofit. <laughs> what yeah, are you? Uh, yeah, so I feel like the health, the nexus between health and technology, it's mm -hmm. very difficult to find global health and technology. Mm -hmm. There's a lot like domestic health, um, work that's been done, but it is definitely like, you have to sort, like sift through a lot of information. Yeah. to get to what you want. Well, you know, I think as you move forward in the, the work you're doing, the one thing that I would say too, that I found with um, business development is especially working with other countries 
is the trust factor is huge. Building the trust mm -hmm. first before a lot of these conversations happen is where you get further with things. And honestly, I don't even know that you need to have the personal relationships with decision makers as much as you need to have personal relationships with those that have the ears of the decision makers mm -hmm. because they will sell it forward. You don't have to sell it to the president of whatever. Um, if you can sell it to somebody who is on the inside and believes like you do and that has the ear of those people. Um, it almost is better because then you get a twofer. You get the person that you have the relationship with who will have that person. Totally. Because they already have the trust of that person. So that's what I'm finding is moving things forward. But um, this is terrific stuff. So, you know, I told you in the very beginning, what I was going to ask you in the end is what type of people do you need to help you move forward as you move into your next level of education and beyond? Because I know while you're doing your grad work, you'll be doing other things as well. You'll continue with your advocacy. What, what do you think you're looking for? Who do you think you're looking for? Yeah, I think I'm definitely looking for, like you said, social entrepreneurs in the specifically the health field. Um, with women in global health as well, there has been a big push to have social entrepreneurs um, in the field. And I would love to meet people that I could either, I could help with through women in global health or that could aid me in understanding the space a little bit better. Mm -hmm. um, and then, Anyone that is a youth leader in their field that um, wants to get involved with WCAPS or with uh, the World Economic Forum, that would be a great uh, starting point for me. Great. Okay. Those are very specific. So that's excellent. Um, so in the area primarily of health, women's health, okay, is, that's what would serve you at this point. Okay. This is terrific stuff. Well, I'm very proud of you. You're doing fantastic work. And I'm so glad that we had a chance to have a conversation and kind of get some things out there for other people to see and it gives them options and opportunities to look at for themselves as they move forward in their own journeys. We have a lot of young people that, that we're connected to that are on their own leadership journeys and moving forward with what they're trying to do to, to change the world, so to speak, make it better. Um, and uh, move, move those policies into place that are gonna make a difference for people's lives, even save people's lives, actually. Totally, 100%. Uh, yeah, it's important. So thank you so much. I appreciate it. And we look forward to checking in with you again. Um, so you stay on. I'm gonna say goodbye to everybody else. If you're watching this on YouTube, everyone, go to www.frontrunnersinnovate.com and you're gonna see this interview and any other bits and pieces we can share from Nikita, maybe some of your social uh, links. Uh, any other pictures you'd like to share with us. So you see it there. Um, this will also become a podcast. So if you're, you know, walking or riding in the car or whatever, you can listen to this and, uh, you know, hear it while you're doing your chores around the house if you want to. Uh, so this is great. So thank you so much, Nikita. We'll stay in touch and uh, stay on and we'll talk about some names that came up while you were talking to me. Okay. Thanks everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.